five, and Southwest won't let me check in until six twenty-five. So I'm going to check in, and then I'm going to start class. That's right. But you can pay to get in the A boarding group, but but I'm, see, it's all staged. All I have to do yeah. is hit check in. B15. Oh, wow. <laughs> well. Okay, good evening. Uh, we can switch to the screen if you guys are. Thank you. Uh, no, to the. There we go. Maybe. And I don't know why, but both the mics in here are on. So I'm going to be really loud, I think. Okay, good. Uh, some things before we jump into the lecture, let me just get going on. Uh, attendance is uh, part of class participation in this class, so uh, there is an attendance sheet. It's going to come around. If your name, uh, last name starts with A through M, you're on the front. If you're, and you flip it top over. If your last name starts with N through W, you're on the back, okay? Uh, and so please sign in and put your student ID. Thank you. And because you guys are here live and in person, uh, you actually get a printed copy of the syllabus. If you are in ITMS 478, take an ITMS 478 syllabus. If you're in ITMS 578, Take an ITMS 578 syllabus. If you're in ITS 878, take one of each because you have to decide by the end of the week whether you're going or by next week whether you're going to do the graduate or undergraduate curriculum. This is professional learning students, and they actually have an option as to whether they uh, do the graduate or undergraduate curriculum. So please take one of the appropriate syllabi and pass them along. I'll start them both with you here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the folks doing the camera, that's all the walking around I'm ever going to do in this class. So, well, welcome and good evening, and welcome to uh, ITMS. Uh, 478, ITMS 578, ITS 878, 
uh, introduction to information security, I'm sorry, uh, cybersecurity management, and our lecture today is in introduction to information security. If I can ever figure out where my mouse is, hold on. There it is. Okay. Um, see, this is why it would help if everybody sat closer, because you wouldn't have these huge gaps between everyone to pass things around. So. Next week, like I say, I'm going to block rows off. Um, so our lecture tonight covers uh, introduction to information security. Uh, we're, today we're going to examine the course syllabus and policies. We're going to talk about the history of information security. We're going to look at key co terms and concepts of cybersecurity. We're going to look at security systems development lifecycle, just very briefly. We're going to talk about characteristics and roles of leadership and management, uh, some principles of information security management, and we're going to discuss uh, security maturity models. So one of the first things that I will do in every class is I will talk about the objectives for that lesson. Objectives for the lesson are all written in such a way that we can try somehow or other to measure whether or not you've achieved the objective. Okay, so these are the things that we expect you to know uh, at the end of each lecture and that will be uh, material that will be tested. Okay, so our, our objectives for this lesson are that students, should, when we're done, students should be able to recall policies and requirements for the course, uh, describe what information security is and how it came to mean what it does today, uh, discuss the history of computer security and how it evolved into information security, cybersecurity, and I'm going to talk about the, the, the tension between those two terms. Uh, identify and define key terms and critical concepts, concepts of cybersecurity. Uh, list fundamental concepts of the information assurance cyber defense discipline. Uh, list the first principles of security. Describe why each principle is important to security and how it enables the development of security mechanisms that can implement desired security policies. Um, describe and list dominant categories of threats to information security. Discuss key characteristics of leadership and management. Differentiate cybersecurity management from general business management. And list and describe the elements of a maturity model. So it's a lot of material packed into a uh, to a single lesson, so uh, we'll, we're going to move pretty fast. Uh, there's a lot of material in this whole course, and you're going to find the lectures are, gonna, are going to move pretty fast. Okay, so first let's talk about the syllabus and the policy. I've handed out the syllabus. It's also available on Blackboard. You will note that uh, there are separate syllabi for the graduate and undergraduate sections of the course. That is a, both a university and a department requirement now, okay? If you, if you are in a class that has both graduate and undergraduate sections and you don't see two syllabi, let me know, because that's somebody not following the rules, okay? This was, uh, came out of our most recent university accreditation, and they said that there has to be real clarity when courses are taught uh, with both graduate and undergraduate students in the same lecture section as to differences in expectations for graduate students uh, in the courses. And one of the ways that we achieve that is by having separate uh, syllabus. Uh, there's a lot of material in the syllabus, but it's only four pages long. It's pretty easy to get through. Um, I keep forgetting to, there's another photo I keep meaning to stick into my uh, lecture at this point. It's a, it was a meme that made the rounds about, oh, a year and a half ago, Reddit and all those places, and it shows this uh, uh, professor, probably about my age, somewhere down in Texas, and uh, he's ripping his shirt open, and his under his uh, t-shirt under his shirt says, "It's in the syllabus," because that is the number one faculty answer when students ask us a question. Okay, because most, of, I'd say, maybe. 55% of the questions we get asked are in the syllabus. And when you ask the question, then I know, damn, you didn't read the syllabus. So it is kind of important to do that. So I would very much appreciate it if you would read the syllabus. Um, 
Lectures are, of course, going to be every Thursday evening in this room. Um, I'm going to block off seats next time so people have to sit closer. Uh, so you might as well plan on it. Um, I will post my lecture notes in advance of the lecture. Uh, there are PDF files in two formats. One is just the slides. Sometimes that's handy because it's nice to have uh, big versions of some of the figures that come with the lectures. And the other are notes pages where there are three slides and places to take notes. The advantage of that is you can print that out and bring it to class and then take notes as I hit each of the slides in the lecture. Uh, when I was a graduate student, one of the things I discovered was that, uh, uh, well, it was, and it was, it wasn't before computers, but it was before uh, uh, iPads and devices like that. And I had faculty members who used to do the PowerPoint notes pages and hand them out. And uh, those were classes that I thought, you know, I always had a little bit better feel for those classes because I didn't have to frantically write notes because I had all the slides and I just had to write notes about each slide. So uh, one of my complaints about the class consistently about my classes is because I have a lot of PowerPoint slides and I'm trying to structure the class so it works really well for students online as well is that, uh, you know, death by PowerPoint. Um, and one of the choices that I give people is, do you want less material? Do you want fewer slides so that you don't feel like I'm barraging you with slides? And then generally the answer is, well, no. And then, so, okay, and then my answer back is, so don't complain about it, okay? I'm trying to give you lots of material um, right there in my lecture. And trust me, almost every slide I'm going to say more about it than, than what's contained on the slide. So the lecture notes are there. They're useful. Uh, readings. Uh, there are two textbooks for the class. For graduate students, they are both mandatory. For undergraduates, one of them, of course, unfortunately the free one, is not mandatory. Okay, it's optional. So I don't expect undergraduates to have necessarily done the reading from uh, the second textbook. You see there are pictures of both textbooks. One is Management of Information Security by Michael Whitman and Herb Mattered. They're uh, faculty members down at Kennesaw State University in Georgia. And uh, they've been consolidating state universities in Georgia. They just combined two other universities into Kennesaw State. Uh, they are actually kind of a powerhouse in cybersecurity. Um, and that book is, for the most part, the book I would have written if I'd written a book for this course. That's what I always look for. I look for a textbook that resonates with me and I go, dang, if I had written a book for this class, that would be the book. Okay, So I like it. I think it's a good book. It, it approaches things well. The chapters used to be in a strange order. Uh, I still don't agree necessarily with the chapter order. I would still arrange them differently, but I at least follow the, the order of the chapters now. I used, to, I used to bounce around from chapter to chapter because I thought they were ordered badly. Uh, the second uh, text is an introduction to information security from the National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST. It's a special, pu special publication 800-12, and you're going to learn all about the NIST special publication series uh, as we move through the class. Uh, that is free. It's brand new. It was uh, just rewritten. This is revision one. I forget the date, uh, July, June, anyway. Um, and uh, it's, it's a very good introduction to uh, information security as well. That one is required for graduate students, so they have a little more reading to do. Um, I do not test uh, on material covered in the textbooks that's not covered in class, OK? Uh, what you're going to find is a lot of material from both textbooks are uh, going to be covered in class. Assignments. Um, everyone will do a research paper or two. Uh, graduate students, there's one significant research paper. It's expected to be fairly large, uh, fairly represent a fair amount of effort on your part. Uh, and leading up to that, I have graduate students give me an outline so I can see that they've thought about what they want to do and they're kind of trying to create a little structure and then I have them give me a bibliography so I can make sure that they're doing actual research and are on track, okay? Trust me, 
that benefits you because by me doing that, you won't be doing all your research in the week before you have to turn the paper in. Uh, undergraduates have two short research papers, three to five pages, with the idea that uh, you get feedback from the first paper so you can improve on whatever you did the first time when you do your second paper. Okay. Um, there will be a group project uh, in the past. We've done lots of different group projects in the class. Um, I am uh, looking at the possibility of actually doing a couple audits, uh, maybe dividing the class in half. Uh, I have uh, someone from uh, the city of Chicago that is looking for some audit support, and I'm going to propose to them that we uh, have a, a student-run uh, audit. Um, and so I'll see if they're amenable to that. Um, and the other audit uh, uh, will have a client, and I'm not quite sure what we're going to do with that yet. Um, I would like to actually do a, an information security audit uh, of the university. Um, and I'll have to get people to uh, obviously buy into that a little bit, uh, which uh, may not happen. So, uh, but that's what, where I would like to go with, with those group projects. Uh, exams and quizzes. There is no midterm exam. Okay, that's in the syllabus. No, it doesn't say there is no midterm exam. It doesn't say that there is a midterm exam, because if there was, it would say so in the syllabus. Okay, so when people come and ask me, is there a midterm exam? I always say, does it say there's one in the syllabus? And they go, no. I said, well, that's because there isn't one. Okay. There is a final exam. There will be quizzes. If people are consistently late getting to class, we're at 625 in the evening. Everybody ought to be able to be here. Um, I know some people come from work, and I understand that. But for the most part, people should be able to be here on time. If I see the class is consistently late, guess what? We'll have pop quizzes first five minutes of class. If you're not here, you don't get to take the quiz. You lose those class participation points. So I hope to not have to give any quizzes. They're extra work for me. Um, so I would much prefer to do, it, to do it that way. Plagiarism. Because there are significant research paper components to this course, it's been plagued by plagiarism, okay? Um, things I have had students do. Uh, Ten years ago, I had a class about this size. I haven't had a class, I had 70 students in there. I have 60 right now. Um, in that class of 70 students, I had 44 graduate students. Twelve of the graduate students turned in outlines for their research paper that were all or partially plagiarized, okay? And one student, I actually found the source research paper for the outline that they turned in. And I said, it's a good thing I caught this early on uh, because guess what? Just because you find a paper online doesn't mean it's any good. It was a crap paper. I said, if you'd have turned that paper in, if I hadn't known it was plagiarized, best you would have gotten on it probably was a C. So, you know, um, the whole point is that I want to see your work and your thoughts. Um, it is important that you do research and that you have uh, citations and that you have sources for your paper. Um, but I also want your original thought. Now, one of the big reasons that people plagiarize in many cases is because uh, a lot of students in our program are not native speakers of English, and they're not confident in their ability to express themselves well in English. I would rather see your thoughts poorly expressed than someone else's thoughts expressed well. Okay, uh, So don't let that stop you. Um, the other issue that we run into is ensuring that you have proper citations for any material you quote. That's one of the reasons why the parameters for the research papers say no more than 33% of your paper may be quoted material. Because in the past, I've had students turn papers in where the entire paper was properly cited quoted material. And they got a zero on the paper and they said, what's wrong? Why did I get a zero? And I said, because this isn't a copy and paste exercise. This is a research paper. I want to see your original ideas. The best papers in this class 
when I hit about page 10 or 12, depending on how long the paper is, we'll have between five and seven pages where there are no citations because it represents the original thoughts or theories of the students writing the paper. Those are papers that get published. And papers out of this class over the years, both, both uh, when I teach it and when Bonnie Goins teaches it, have been published a great deal. We have 14 chapters in the CRC uh, um, Cybersecurity Management Handbook, which is 13 more than any other single university. Okay, And almost every, I think Bonnie wrote one, but all the rest of them have been uh, chapters that were submitted by students in this class and actually, in some cases, folks who took this class and then liked the idea of writing the papers for, for the thing so much they wrote two or three more. Um, so, um, you know, I would, I would love to see original research. In the section in Blackboard where it talks about resources for research papers, uh, there are two example papers. They are not in the format that I require people to turn in uh, because they're, they're formatted as uh, white papers, but they were papers originally submitted for this class, uh, both uh, by folks who have gone on to some significant accomplishments, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but the whole point is it needs to be your work, okay? I don't want to see other people's work. I don't want to see exact quotes uh, that you fail to provide citations for because that is plagiarism, okay? It is not acceptable to present the work of others as your own. And who knows, maybe your own is, is going to be really good. Uh, other policies, um, be on time. We'll take a 10-minute break in the middle of class. Please come back on time, okay? It's annoying if I start the lecture and then for the next five minutes people are filtering in and getting in the seats. When you're in an auditorium like this where, you know, people have to move towards the center in order to fill in seats well, it's really uh, painful to have that occurring. So uh, when, when we do take our break, please do come back and get into the seats right on time. Okay, um, that's uh, syllabus and policies. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I'm Ray Trigstead. Uh, I'm the Associate Chair of the Department of Information Technology and Management. I've been here at IIT um, as of, uh, let's see, October. I will have been here 25 years. So I've been here a while. Um, and so let me talk a little bit about my background. My background is plaid. I'm sorry, I can't resist puns. You need to know that about me. It's genetic, it comes from my mom. My mom loves puns too, so uh, yeah, my background is plaid. Okay, um, I'm from Southern California. Uh, I left my small hometown of Vista, California uh, at the age of 17 to attend the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, where I earned a Bachelor of Science, and my major, you know, of all things, was European Studies. Okay, uh, but when you go to uh, you know one of the service academies, what you're going to do when you graduate doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your major. So uh, I graduated and became a helicopter pilot. Um, that's uh, one of my helicopters, uh, me flying, uh, it's operating, supporting hydrographic uh, survey operations in Indonesia. Uh, I mostly flew anti-submarine warfare uh, as a helicopter pilot. Um, and that is the helicopter I flew in my over a thousand hours as a, as a primary, I'm sorry, an advanced uh, uh, flight instructor for people who are earning their wings to be Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard aviators. And uh, I still actually own a house down in the area where I did that down in Florida. Um, most of my time at sea was spent on destroyers. That's one of the destroyers I went to sea on. And my last tour in the Navy was my first time that I wasn't flying. I came here to teach Navy ROTC here at IIT. That's the Navy ROTC unit. Um, so oddly enough, my previous career and my current career literally overlap by two years. Because the last two years I was a naval officer, I was an assistant professor in naval science at IIT. And that's one of those things you just, 
you can't pull off, you know. How often do people have two careers that literally overlap? Um, I have uh, three children. Uh, that's my daughter's wedding there, which was uh, last October in California. Um, and uh, my two sons are on the ends there. And uh, this is a recent picture. My daughter's not in this because she's in California. Uh, but my, uh, young, my sons are in front of me there, and my wife and my uh, son's wife and their puppy. I have no grandchildren. I have a grand puppy. So, whose name is Roscoe Lux, or Roscoe for short. Uh, okay, so that's me. Um, let's plunge into the topic at hand. What is information security? Information security in today's enterprise is a well-informed sense of assurance that the information risks and controls are in balance. Talk a little bit about the history of information security. Computer security began immediately after the first mainframes were developed. Mainframe computers initially took up entire rooms. And in fact, before we had semiconductors, mainframe computers were built out of literal mechanical relays that opened and closed. Some of you may have heard an apocryphal story that actually is true, that the first computer bug was a real bug. That is, they ran a run in one of the early digital computers, and the run failed, and Grace Hopper, who is one of the pioneers of computing, of digital computing, went to investigate why the run failed and found a moth trapped in one of the relays that had closed. She pulled the moth out. She taped the moth in the logbook for the, for the system to show why it had failed. So if you, know, if you hear this idea that the first computer bug was actually a bug, it's true. Well, it's a moth. A moth's not a bug, I know. Bug is a pretty generic term, though. Uh, why did, they, why did we do these computers? Because we had groups of folks developing code-breaking computations uh, during World War II, and they created the first digital computers. Prior to that, there were computers. They were analog computers. If you've ever seen uh, an analog ballistics computer for calculating ballistics of, of gunfire, they're amazing. These big brass devices with you know, all these gears and wheels uh, and they worked, okay? So there, were, there actually were analog computers, uh, but digital computers developed to break codes. Uh, all we needed for physical controls during that, during that time were you know, badges, keys, facial recognition of authorized personnel, uh, the controlled access to sensitive military locations. So all we had to have was physical security for, for computer security. And there were only very rudimentary controls to defend against physical theft, espionage, and sabotage. We didn't have to worry about anybody stealing the computer. They weren't going to carry off a whole building, you know. But uh, they could carry off pieces. Um, one of the reasons that we, we broke, we had computers was to break codes. And this picture is not really topical to the lesson, but it shows a very high visibility artifact uh, associated with the subtopic of information security. More properly, it would be part of uh, the study of cryptography from a later lesson. Um, but this is the Enigma code machine. This is one of two. The Japanese had a code machine, and we had an operation to break that code called MAGIC. And both the United States and Britain were heavily involved in breaking uh, codes uh, from the Enigma. And uh, you may have heard of Benchley Park. It was uh, where this code breakers in the, the United Kingdom were employed. And uh, 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 you may have, there was a whole movie recent, not that long ago about Alan Turing who was one of the key figures in those uh, code-breaking efforts. So that is the Enigma code machine. There's a, there's a picture of it in the book, but this is my own picture because this is, this is me holding the same Enigma code machine that's pictured in the book because it belongs to the National Security Agency. But, uh, you know, <laughs> so there, there I am holding that. So the 1960s. In the 1960s, the Department of Defense... Uh, had an agency that's still around called the Advanced Research 
uh, project agency, ARPA, and they began examining the feasibility of building out a system of redundant network communications. The idea was to create a computer network that would allow computers to communicate and would operate when the network, and this is the word they used, was in tatters. The idea was that data traveling from point to point in the network would just route around holes. And that was the whole concept behind building what, what became known as the ARPANET. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Roberts uh, developed the project from its inception, and this is the ARPANET program plan, June 3rd, 1968. Okay, um, So I'm old, but I'm not that old, because in 1968 I was in eighth grade. Uh, but that's, that's when the ARPANET uh, came, came about. Uh, the ARPANET grew in popularity, as did its potential for misuse. One of the things that we discovered, uh, Robert Metcalf, who some of you might have heard of, uh, who is credited as being the inventor of Ethernet, among other things, and by the way, is a, is a friend of Bill Adinsky's. Bill knows all those people. Uh, so if you're uh, uh, taking uh, uh, 548 at some point, you'll have, you'll have Bill and... Yeah, he knows all these people. Um, discovered that there were some fundamental problems with ARPANET security. Um, there were no safety procedures for dial-up connections, and there was no user identification and authorization. And in fact, I know this is true because uh, this was in the 1970s. Uh, the, my best man for my wedding was a year behind me at the Naval Academy, and he had the distinction of being the second brigade computer systems officer as, as a senior at the Naval Academy. I'll have to tell you later on the story about the first brigade computer systems officer, but that's when we get into hacking. We'll talk about him. Uh, but my friend was the second one, and I went up to see him at his house in, in Seal Beach in La, the Los Angeles area, and in the hallway of the house that he shared with two other guys, there was a teletype terminal with a, with a phone modem that you could put the handset of a phone in, you know, to, to connect to the teletype terminal. And I said, what is that? And he goes, it's an ARPANET terminal. So they had an ARPANET terminal, you know, in the hallway of their house. Uh, and that's still the point where there really was no, no security provided. Um, what happened, though, is we went from the point where computers were something that you accessed remotely to the growth of the microprocessor. In the 70s, that expanded computing capabilities, and at the same time, it greatly expanded security threats. So computer security needed to become a discipline. It did that with the release of R609, the RAND report entitled Security Controls for Computer Systems, the report of the Defense Science Board Task Force on Computer Security, and it was published in June 1970. That uh, link will actually still get you to uh, a copy of the report, an updated copy from 1979, I believe. Uh, it attempted to define multiple controls and the mechanisms that would be necessary to protect a multi-level computer system. We saw then that the scope of computer security grew from physical security to include the safety of the data, uh, the concept of limiting unauthorized access to that data, and the involvement of personnel from multiple levels of the organization. The fact that there were multiple people within any, in, within any given organization that had responsibilities for computer security. In the 90s, networks of computers became more common, and so did the need to interconnect those networks. The result was that what had started as the ARPANET became the Internet. I've always thought this is one of the most ironic things in history, because think about it. The ARPANET was funded by the U.S. Department of Defense. And what is the Internet? The Internet is the first functioning anarchy in the history of mankind. The Internet, no one runs it. It is literally 
meets all the classic definitions of anarchy. So I love the fact that it was the Department of Defense that created the first system that functions as an anarchical system. Um, so the internet was the first manifestation of this global network of networks. And that's why it was the internet, because it connected networks. Originally, networks mostly at schools and colleges, like this, and uh, government agencies. Uh, in early internet deployments, security was a low priority. I can tell you that, because we had internet when I came here to the university, but there wasn't, there wasn't a whole lot of any kind of security. Um, so what has happened since then? Well, of course, now we're in the present, and the Internet has brought millions of computer networks into communication with each other, and many of those are unsecured, and that's a problem. So the ability to secure each computer connected to the global network has inf is influenced by the computer on e by the, I'm sorry by the security on every computer to which it's connected, or as they taught me when I joined the Navy. The strength of a chain is determined by the strength of the weakest link in the chain. Okay? Because the, the whole chain could be enormously strong, but if there's one weak link, that's how strong the chain is as a whole. And unfortunately, that's to a great extent how information security functions as well. Now, I want to talk about, as I talk about history, we had some enormous developments in the last year in information security. In 2016, there was an executive order released under the previous administration that uh, had some serious implications for cybersecurity and a much more uh, critical executive order that was released May 11th of this year. Uh, the executive order is called... Um, I forget that. I didn't write down the name of the executive order. I should have done that. But what it did, and this is what's significant about it, is it took a document that existed, the NIST Framework for Improving Critical Infrastructure Security, more commonly known as the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, and it made that the top-level governing document for managing U.S. government cybersecurity risk. That is hugely significant. One of the things that it did was it made the textbook for the class obsolete. Sorry about that. I mean, it's useful, and you're going to learn stuff out of it. But to some extent, they got a Whitman and Matter. I haven't, I haven't run into them recently, but they need to sit down and rewrite it because, you know, essentially what they put in that textbook has been superseded. And some of the areas that they focus on in the text, you're going to notice in my lectures, I don't. Okay, because there's no longer areas of focus in the way the government constructs the whole NIST program for cybersecurity. So uh, the government released a couple other important publications. One of them is NISTER, okay, and that stands for NIST uh, Interagency Report. And uh, it's called the Cybersecurity Framework Implementation Guidance for Federal Agencies, which tells the federal government how to go about implementing uh, the NIST framework, because the NIST framework, interestingly enough, even though it was written by NIST, does not require use of the whole panoply of NIST publications. You can implement it with several other methodologies that are in wide use for implementing and governing cybersecurity in the enterprise. And that was a very smart thing when they wrote that uh, framework, uh, the cybersecurity framework. So. This is specific to implementation of the government. Uh, and then special publication 800-181, the NICE Cybersecurity Workforce Framework was published this month. Okay, so, and this defines roles in cybersecurity in, in a, a depth that's never been attempted previously. And so you're going to hear more about this too. So between all of this, it's, it's really some huge changes. I taught this course this summer. I had to rewrite the course as I went along all summer, and you're going to see I'm going to have to rewrite the course uh, as I go along through this term. And I expect that other things will change before we reach the end of the course. So let's talk about cybersecurity and what it means. Information technology is the first 
term that we have to look at. So there's a variety of terms. Information technology is the vehicle that stores and transports information from one business unit to another. Okay, stores, transports, processes. Uh, the vehicle can break down. And that's why cybersecurity becomes so critical. The concept of computer security as it evolved was eventually replaced by information security. And information security, even though that's the predominant term still in use by the government, is being replaced, and we see this even in government publications, by the term cybersecurity. And cybersecurity uh, covers a broad range of issues. It ranges from protection of data out to protection of human resources. So it's a lot more than, than you might expect. Cybersecurity, and this is the key piece, when computer security started, it was, the, it was literally the responsibility of a very discreet group of people within an organization. But today, it is no longer the sole responsibility of a discreet group of people in any organization. Why? Because users are involved in cybersecurity, and in any organization, essentially, everybody is a user. So that means within any organization, everyone has an involvement in cybersecurity. It's a responsibility of every employee and especially managers because they have to be responsible overall. Cybersecurity as two words and cybersecurity as one word are both correct uses, by the way. So either one is fine. In the, in the scope of the course, I'm going to use it as one word, okay, because that's what's emerged um, as the principal use in academia, and that is the way it's being dealt with by the folks that are writing the new curricular standards for degree programs in cybersecurity and also the accreditation standards for accreditation of programs in cybersecurity. And I'm just trying to get people, because there's some people that do this that are really, annoy it annoys the heck out of me. And I think, I, I think one guy who I bugged about it a lot has stopped doing it. There's a former chair of the, of the computer science department at West Point who's in the West Point Cyber Institute. And he used to just use the word cyber <laughs> to mean cybersecurity. I'm like, you can't, we can't do that, you know. I'm sorry. Cyber, I know the word has become tied to cybersecurity, but it doesn't mean cybersecurity just to say cyber. And you notice, what are they called at West Point? The Cyber Institute. So, and I know he had something to do with that, <laughs> but I've been... I've been bugging him about it. So I hate it when people use cyber when they mean cybersecurity. So please don't, please don't do that. Um, so what is security? So let's, we're, we're going to hold, go through a whole slew of definitions here. But one of the definitions we definitely have to look at is what is security? It is the quality or state of being secure to be free from danger. Or another definition, freedom from risk or danger, safety, freedom from doubt, anxiety, or fear, confidence. That's a long definition. But that's a pretty good definition of what security means. Okay. Um, my last name is Norwegian. And it, it's two, it's two uh, words put together, trig and stab. Trig in Norwegian means what? It means... Safe, okay, means secure. Stad is the Norwegian cognate for the English word stead, like farmstead or homestead. Uh, a gathering of buildings that's not big enough to be a village or a town, you know. So Trigstad was the name of our family farm in Norway. So safety, or security, I'm sorry, is my last name. Safe, safety, really. But uh, yeah, I know. It's a stretch, I understand. Definition, to be protected from adversaries. That's, that's security in the context of, for example, national security. So when we talk about national security, that's what that means, to be protected from adversaries. It's often achieved by a whole variety of strategies that are undertaken simultaneously and or are used in combination with one another. Security even though our focus is cybersecurity, certainly is not the only aspect of security that you find within an organization. A successful organization will have multiple layers of security in place. So they'll have physical security, 
personnel security, uh, operation security, communication security, network security, information security, and you'll see that in some of our uh, slides we use the abbreviation InfoSec. The book likes to use that. If you've read any, hopefully you've read the chapter in the book, maybe not, but please, you do. It is mandatory, please get it, read it. Um, it's, and it's now cybersecurity, but information security and cybersecurity, I, I'm sorry. They are different words, sets of words, but they really mean the same thing. And then finally, computer security, which is still, there is still such a thing as computer security, but it is, in, in many senses, a very small f subset of cybersecurity today. Um, so what is information security? Information security, therefore, is protecting information and its critical elements, okay, including systems and hardware that store, use, and transmit the information. Here's one definition. The concepts, techniques, technical measures, and administrative measures used to protect information assets from deliberate or inadvertent unauthorized acquisition, damage, disclosure, manipulation, modification, loss, or use. That's from uh, the IBM Dictionary of Computing uh, from 1994. So that's the definition from a while back, still completely valid. Um, the protection of information and information systems from unauthorized access, use, disclosure, disruption, modification, or destruction in order to ensure confidentiality, integrity, and availability. That is from the Committee on National Security Systems Glossary uh, from 2015, and it's quoted in this special publication, 800-12 Revision 1, which was just published in, there, I knew I had it written down somewhere, June. Okay. Um, it is the protection of information and its critical elements, including systems and hardware that use, transmit, and store that information. Tools are used in, to ensure that we are securing our assets properly. Tools like policy, awareness, training, education, and technology. Policy, training, education, awareness, and technology. You notice technology is only one of five there, okay? Uh, I know a lot of folks who deal with security believe that, oh, yeah, it's all done by just having the right technology in place. But that's why we have this course, to teach you that. There's a lot more to it than technology. Information security includes information security management, computer security, data security, network security, okay, and any number of other aspects. It has to tie tightly to physical security, because guess what? If you can't physically secure your information resources, they're not secure. But the point of this course, and the thing that you're going to carry away from it when we're all done, is that policy is, is the central element of information security efforts. Okay, Inf Trying to implement information security in the absence of policy is not efficacious or realistic. So why cybersecurity? Cybersecurity performs four important functions for an organization. It protects the organization's ability to function. Now, when I first started working in information technology, the term that you heard when people referred to information technology was that it was a support function within a company. In today's world, in most organizations, if you take away information technology, you might as well lock the doors and go home because no one can do their job. So it's important, and, and all of you being students in computing, you need to bear this in mind. Information technology is not a supporting function. It is a facilitating function. It facilitates the work that people do. And in most cases in today's world, no IT, no work. Okay? So it is a facilitating function. And that's why cybersecurity is critical because essentially without the information technology assets, the organization is not able to function. It enables the safe operation of applications that are being implemented on organizational information technology systems or information systems. It protects the data that the organization collects and uses. 
some organizations, the single most important co component of the company is data. Okay? What company is data? Google. It's huge. Second large, second or third largest company in the world, possibly. And what do they, what do they have? They have data. Okay. Uh, finally, it safeguards the organization's technology assets that are in use. So that's why, that's why we have cybersecurity. Organizations have to realize that cybersecurity decisions, and you're going to hear this reiterated time and time again as we move through the course. It was a particular metaphor that the authors of the book chose, and I like it because it resonates well with me, and it speaks back to my experience in cybersecurity. Um, and I will talk about how I got into this field uh, as we move through the course, so I didn't put that in my background. Um, but organizations have to realize that cybersecurity decisions should involve three distinct groups of managers and professionals. And the term they use for this in our text is communities of interest. It's a pretty good term. So I'm, I'm going to stick with it. Those that are in the field of cybersecurity, okay, professionals in the information security, cybersecurity arena, those that are in the field of information technology, and those from the rest of the organization. Now, very often, it's focused on management of the organization. So when you see communities of interest, you'll see cybersecurity, information technology, management because management constitutes the backbone of the folks in the rest of the organization. So there's a, a figure, first figure in the textbook is figure 1-1, components of information technology. And it's this little temple. Uh, I made a prettier colored one than the one that's in the book. But uh, uh, So where do you get these components? Well, the first is computer security. Computer security in our, in our program is in ITMS 448, ITMS 548, it's also in ITMS 458, which is operating system security, ITMS 458 or 558. We also see uh, network security, and that's in ITMS 448, ITMS 548, which is cybersecurity technologies. That's the technology counterpart to this course. And data security, ITMS 428, ITMS 528, uh, data, uh, which is dead database security. Okay, and then what's there at the top? We see management of information security with policy and information security governance. That's this course. That's what we're doing here. So we are the capstone on the, the concept of the components of information security. Down there at the bottom, you see three words, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These are three words that are known as the CIA triad. In this instance, CIA does not stand for Central Intelligence Agency. It stands for confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is the standard that was established very early on. I should look. I believe it's probably in the RAND report, actually. That might be the first place where it was formally documented. And the idea here is that the, all three of these things are critical to information security, and they're all things that we have to protect. Confidentiality, integrity, availability. Now, the CIA triad over the years has been expanded further into a list of critical characteristics of information. That is, what things in information are, are, uh, are critical. One of the things that people aren't necessarily clear about is the difference between data and information. There's a lot of different definitions, and I'm not saying any of them are any more valid than, than the other, but this is the one we're effectively going to use in here, okay, because I think this one's pretty solid. Data or data, and by the way, I think the dictionary says either one is fine, um, is numbers, characters, images, or other outputs from devices to convert physical quantities into symbols. Typically, data is input into a computer, stored and processed there, or transmitted output to another human or computer. Now, what happens to data? When data is correctly organized, filtered, and presented with context, it becomes information. Okay. So that's why you very often hear people refer to raw data. 
Raw data is rarely of any value until you do something with it and place it. The key thing there is placing it in context. Then it becomes information. Information is what has value to the recipient. Okay? Raw data rarely has any intrinsic value, but information definitely does. And information has a set of critical characteristics. These are expanded from the CIA triangle that we examined earlier. So the value comes from these characteristics. Availability, accuracy, authenticity, confidentiality, integrity, utility, and possession. Now, one of the ways of expressing how the CIA triangle was originally viewed as being uh, how we could apply it to the bigger picture of information was this model called the CNS security model, CNSS security model, also known as the McCumber Cube. It provides a little bit more detailed perspective. It was an attempt to create a three-dimensional model that expanded on the CIA triangle in, in some ways that could allow people to visualize the panoply of pieces that come into play as we try to protect the security of information. So it covers three dimensions of information security. Now, it omits the discussion of detail and policies and guidelines that direct the implementation. It's just a, a big picture view. Um, and the weakness of the model is if you only view it from one perspective, it's not a very good model. You have to see all three axes, okay? So there are three axes. One axis, availability, integrity, and confidentiality. One axis, storage, processing, and transmission. These are the three states of information, okay? Three states. And then how that information will be protected. In other words, the methodologies that we will make use of and that is policy, education, and technology, okay? And you notice that when we get to confidentiality, technology, and transmission, that's the edge condition. What is that? That's where, that's where stuff is the most vulnerable because that's where we have to apply heavy doses of technology because the things that we're trying to protect the confidentiality, that being the most critical of those three, and in transmission, which is the area where information data is at its most vulnerable, you can that's that that's why the model works, okay? Because you can see that. And they, they then you see it there as a big cube. Okay, and the cube shows all three of these dimensions. So let's talk about each of these key concepts. Because these are important. These are, as we said, the key concepts of information security. Confidentiality. Confidentiality of information ensures that, uh, well, it's an attribute of information that describes how we protect data from disclosure or exposure to unauthorized individuals or systems. Um, confidentiality means that we must limit access to information only to those who need it. And we need to prevent access by those who don't need it. Okay, That's the whole core of confidentiality, is only people who need the information have access and everyone else is denied. There are a variety of measures that we can make use of to protect confidentiality. Uh, we have, First of all, we have a system to determine the criticality of information and the level to which it needs to be protected. This comes into play through something called information classification. So classification systems become important because it's what dictates how critical any given piece of information is in terms of the need to protect. Um, we also see, I'm sorry, the use of secure document storage. So if we have information still printed on paper, and there is some of that out there, uh, we have to store that security, uh, securely, I'm sorry. We see the application of general security policies that then drive down to the implementation of technological controls, as an example, governed by some 
governing policies that say, hey, here's what we should do to protect this, and here's how we maybe ought to do it. And finally, education of information custodians and end users. Obviously, those of us who are in the cybersecurity field were, were allegedly educated. That's why you're here. But end users are notoriously not educated. <laughs> Put it that way. Another key concept is integrity. Integrity is the quality or state of being whole, complete, and uncorrupted. The integrity of information is threatened if it's exposed to corruption, damage, destruction, or other disruption of its authentic state. Okay, information that is does not have integrity loses enormous value. Okay, corruption can occur when information is being compiled, when it's being stored, or when it's being transmitted. Everybody, you know, is in constant fear of, of a hard drive failure if you maintain a lot of critical information. Uh, I'm an expensive guy because I run multiple computer systems. I have an office here. I have an office at Rice Campus. I have my, my portable computer asset here. And they're all backed up to the cloud all the time. Okay. Uh, so that's how I try to protect the integrity of my information. Availability. Making information accessible and correctly formatted for use without interference or obstruction. I have some great availability stories you hear as we go through the course too. Um, a user is either a person or another computer system who has access to information in a usable format. Users have no care or concern about information that is not presented to them in context in a way that they can make use of. Okay, um, so availability is important. Availability doesn't imply that information is accessible to any user. It just means that it's available to authorized users, and that's important to remember. Availability does, isn't universal availability, and we'll talk more about that too. Privacy has recently become a considerably more important concept vis-a-vis uh, -vis cybersecurity. Privacy is not a component of cybersecurity, but privacy is a key piece that is protected by cybersecurity. Okay, so privacy in the context of information security is the right of individuals or groups to protect themselves and their information from unauthorized access, providing confidentiality. Privacy as a term normally specifically applies to personal information about individuals. Okay, because that's what privacy really is, is about. Um, information is collected, used, and stored by an organization and should only be used for the purposes stated to the data owner at the time of collection. So if somebody wants information from you, they should be telling you what they're going to do with that information, how they're going to make use of that information. Okay? So. This doesn't focus on freedom from observation, but means that the information will be used only in ways that are known to the person providing it. Uh, one of the things that we've seen recently is a lot of information aggregation. A lot of organizations will collect, swap, and sell personal information as a commodity. Today, it's, it's entirely possible to collect and combine personal information from several different sources, and this is known as information aggregation, which has resulted in databases that could be used in ways that the original data owner hasn't agreed to or, in fact, doesn't even knows about. Another key concept is identification. Uh, access control mechanisms uh, allow, determine who gets access to information. And the identification is an access control mechanism whereby an unverified entity who seeks access to a resource provides a label by which they're known to the system. It has to be a unique one of label. Okay. Information systems possess the characteristic of identification when they're able to recognize individual users. Now, for a long time in our world, it was good enough for somebody to have a name as a label. You know, The problem is that names are of limited utility. I mean, if your name is John Smith in the United States, that doesn't identify you at all. Okay. I consider myself very lucky having a last name that's uncommon. 
And my daughter, whose first name is Blair, which is a Scottish name combined with a Norwegian last name, is literally the only person on earth who is Blair Trigstad. So, you know, she, when she got married, she still uses her last name, but she's Blair Trigstad Stowe. But it gives her a completely distinctive identity. That's almost unheard of in today's world, though. We have to have other methods of identifying individuals. One of the things that has worked actually remarkably well, by the way, is email addresses. Because an email address is distinctive. Okay? There's only one person who can have an email address. Um, and you may not have thought about it that way, but if you combine your name with your email address, it absolutely, uniquely, distinctly identifies you. So this is identification. Identification and authentication are essential to establishing the level of access, that is the authorization that an individual is granted within an information system. Authentication is what follows identification. This is an access control mechanism that requires validation and verification of an unauthenticated entity's purported identity. Are you who you really say you are? And how do you prove that? You do that through authentication. It's a process by which a control establishes whether a user or a system has the identity that they claim to have. Um, individual users can disclose a personal identification number, um, a password or a passphrase to authenticate their identities in a computer system. Authorization is what follows the, the access control mechanisms that we've discussed. Identification, authentication. Authorization is the access control mechanism that represents the matching of an authenticated entity to a list of information assets and corresponding access levels. It says, hey, here's what you can look at in the system. Uh, after the identity of a user is authenticated, authorization defines what the user has been specifically and explicitly permitted by the proper authority to do, such as access, modify, or delete the contents of an information asset. Accountability is the access control mechanism that ensures that all actions on a system, authorized or unauthorized, can be attributed to an authenticated identity. It's also known as auditability. And in the wake of some very serious financial misconduct in corporate America, uh, this has become a very critical piece of computing in the enterprise today. So that when any, whenever someone makes an action in a the system, there should be what we now call an audit trail. There's a record of who did that or what other computer system did that. It exists when a control provides assurance that every activity that's undertaken can be attributed to a named person or a known automated process. It's commonly associated with system audit logs, but uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite an important concept. Another key concept in security is non-repudiation. That's the use of cryptographic tools to ensure that parties to a transaction are authentic so they cannot later deny having participated in the transaction. Now there's a set of first principles of security, but we're going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to come back and tackle the first principles of security. So uh, we're going to take a nine minute break. My, my clock says 731. Let's come back at 740. Okay. Um, and please, Please try to be back on time so we can get started on time. If anybody has individual questions that they need to deal with, uh, you can come down and ask. I'm going to take the microphone off because I have two microphones running, so it makes me really loud.
just say is your favorite helicopter to fly? See, I only flew two months. Mm. And I really, I love them both. I can't tell you that I pick one over the other. They're, they're used for different things. Yeah. But I really like flying both of them. If you get a chance, you ought to take your friend in the ash box. Yeah, we keep mean, I keep meaning to do that. It's the greatest I know show. we'll be go there. It's the greatest show I've ever seen. I have seen. some connections there, yeah. It's the greatest show I've ever seen. Uh, actually, it's the best thing I've ever flown in the world. things about my family is that I have never flown uh, a Navy tactical jet, but my wife has. <laughs> How did she go? She, she went on fl a, a flight indoctrination program when she was in college. Was the Navy's she flight indoctrination. Navy she was not. But you don't have to be in the Navy to do the flight indoctrination program. So she did the building bunker. She did the altitude uh, chamber. She did the, the bailout training. What she flew in a TA-4. What is the purpose of that program? To try to get people to join the Navy. Really? Wow. Yeah. It's, so it's not to have people in the Navy. It's just to have them join? Yeah. That must be a very important program. I don't think they do it too much. Okay, we're going to start again. Uh, I see almost everybody's back. I very much appreciate that. Uh, the sign-in sheet is here. Uh, one of the things that I will do in class... Uh, is uh, if somebody is not here, I will put a circle in front of their name. And if they come, if you come late, you're certainly welcome to come sign it. But I'll know you're late because there's a circle uh, in front of where your signature goes. Uh, actually, we did pretty well. Let's see, one, two, three, oh, four. We only got four people who are not here. Um, that's that's pretty darn good for the first meeting of class. Um, Okay, first principles of security. These first principles of security are elucidated in the NIST Special Publication 800-12 Revision 1. Uh, they used to, they are also in this Special Publication 800-14. Uh, and in the previous version of the lecture, I used those. They have slightly different wording. But I looked at it and said, hey, you know, they're updating all this stuff to fit with the new NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. So I'm going to use, anytime they have something new, I'm going to use the new version. So these are a little bit different. These are in the text, but they're a little bit different because they come from a newer publication. Some key things to remember. Information security supports the mission of the organization. Every organization has a mission. You can't accomplish your mission without the, the assets necessary to to, to uh, accomplish the mission. And information security protects those assets. Those assets don't function, you can't carry out your mission. So that's, that's the key, first one. Information security is an integral element of sound management. Okay? If managers are doing their job within an organization, part of their job is to ensure that the organization's resources are properly protected and that people are able to make use of those resources in a consistent and secure manner. Consistent is one of the key pieces there because if it's not secure, you can't ensure consistency. Okay. Information security protections are implemented so as to be commensurate with risk. Now, one of the other definitions that we're going to deal with and talk a lot about is that information security is a component of managing risk within an organization. Every organization manages risk. Okay. Now, I have uh, the good fortune to have had the opportunity to be involved in risk management in a variety of methodologies. And one of the other things that you may not think about, but safety within an organization is in one context exactly the same as security, because both of them are about managing risks to the organization, safety and security. And in some organizations where there's a central risk management function, they'll be combined. So we have to determine what level of risk is acceptable to the organization, and then we're going to put protections in place that will be commensurate with what we view as an acceptable level of risk. Information security roles and responsibilities are made explicit. Everyone has to know who is responsible for what. 
Every person within an organization with an information security policy has a responsibility towards uh, ensuring that security is maintained properly. What's your role at the university? You don't know because the university doesn't have an information security policy. Shh, don't tell anybody. Information security responsibilities for system owners go beyond their own organization, right? Because every kind of organization, nonprofit organization, business, government agency, Boy Scout troop, whatever it is, they connect with other things within the world. And normally there are data flows, okay? In today's world, it's almost impossible not to have data flows with other organizations. And as soon as that data flow takes place, you have some responsibility for security beyond your own horizons. Information security requires a comprehensive and integrated approach. Why? Because if we don't have a comprehensive and integrated approach, we're going to miss something. And what does that do? It makes a hole. What happens when people find holes? They go through them. Okay? That's the problem. So information security is assessed and monitored regularly. Now, in the course of, the, of, the, of going through our class here, we're going to talk about auditing. And it's important for you to understand because it's not necessarily clear at, at an initial take that assessment and auditing are not the same thing. Assessment is an ongoing process. You do it all the time, okay? And assessment doesn't, isn't confined to security. We do assessment in all kinds of things. Uh, we assess our classes, right? One of the reasons we assess our classes is so that we can support a process of continuous improvement. And that's the idea behind assessment in security as well. Um, so what happens in academia that's an audit? Well, we are accredited. So every six years, an accreditation body comes and does effectively an audit. I'm one of those people. I'm, I'm a program evaluator for ABET, for information technology degree programs. And I'm hoping to become a program evaluator for cybersecurity when it goes into effect as well. So like this year, uh, this term, I'm going off one week. I'll be back in time for class, but I'm going off to uh, do a, a, a program assessment of another university. That's an audit, OK? Um, and, and the same thing in, in IT, we have audits and the audits, one of the pro goals of the audit is to make sure that security is assessed and monitored. It, it can't happen just at the time of an audit. It has to happen all the time. So we ensure that the controls that we have in place to protect our assets are efficacious and are actually working. Um, information security is constrained by societal and cultural factors. That's true. Okay, Society and culture constrain what's acceptable and we just have to work with that that's a hard one too um, okay so one of the metaphors that's been commonly used in information security comes from something called the art of war by sun tzu so I have appropriate chinese music to go with it here turn it off sorry <laughs> Okay, uh, I mean, I get it stopped. Okay, these are the quotes from Sun Tzu's Art of War. Therefore, I say, one who knows the enemy and knows himself will not be in danger in a hundred battles. One who does not know the enemy but knows himself will sometimes win, sometimes lose. One who does not know the enemy and does not know himself will be in danger in every battle. So Sun Tzu wrote in the 6th century BC, um, and by the way, if you come into my office, you saw the bamboo scroll in the background? Well, I have one in English, but I have Sun Tzu's Art of War hanging on my, the wall of my office. Uh, uh, I've taught a couple courses for, of all people, the Beijing Police Department. Uh, I've taught courses in, in computer crime and computer security for the Beijing Police Department, so I have 
You're giving me some kind of cool things like the Art of War. There is a copy, by the way, of the Art of War in the resources attached to this lesson. Because it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable to read it uh, and realize that this guy was writing this, you know, 2,600 2, years ago. Okay, so the first thing is know ourselves. Uh, risk management is a process, which means that uh, uh, safeguards and controls that are devised and implemented are not install and forget devices. We have to know ourselves. So to protect your organization's information, you have to know yourself. You have to be familiar with the information assets to be protected, and then the systems, mechanisms, and methods that we're using to store, transport, process, and protect them. One of the things that you'll see as we move through is that you have to know what resources you have. One of the things that organizations who do not have a formal information security function within the organization have to do up front is they have to, they have to do an inventory. And what, what, what information assets do we have? Know the enemy. Um, Informed of our own nature and aware of our weaknesses, we must then know the enemy. So to protect your organization's information, you have to know the threats that you face. Um, for information security, this means identifying, examining, and understanding the threats that most directly affect our organization and the security of the organization's information assets. We can then use our understanding of these aspects to create a list of threats that we prioritize by their importance to the organization. So let's talk about the components of an information system. To fully understand the importance of information security, we have to know the elements of an information system. An information system is much more than computer hardware, and it's important to recognize that. The entire, it is the entire set of software, hardware, data, people, and procedures that are necessary to use information as a resource within the organization. Notice that it includes people. People are part of information systems. It's defined by federal law, U.S. Code, 44 U.S. Code Section 3502, as a, a discrete set of information resources organized for the collection, processing, maintenance, use, sharing, dissemination, or disposition of information. Pretty broad. So it's all the resources, including the people. So we, we have to secure the, res the components. And when we're considering the security of information system components, it's important to understand the concept of a computer, which can be either the subject of an attack and or the object of an attack. When a computer is the subject of an attack, that means it's being used as an active tool to conduct the attack. When it is the object of the attack, it's the entity that's being attacked. Now, one of the things that we see, and I mentioned this, is there is a tension. The CIA triangle is a triangle, and there is a tension between those elements because we have to balance security and access. It's impossible to obtain perfect security. It's important to recognize that security is not an absolute. It is a process. We don't have, we can't just look at it and go, oh, we have security. No, it doesn't work that way. It is a, a process. And it has to be a balance between protection and protection in the context when we're dealing with protection normally is uh, associated with the two pieces, confidentiality and integrity, with the third piece, availability. Okay, To achieve balance, the level of security has to allow reasonable access, yet it has to protect against threats. So... You know, there are some key concepts in information security here. We have, we have threats, threat agents, exploits, vulnerabilities, attacks, information assets. We're going to look at all of these. 
But let's talk about threats. To make sound decisions about information security, to create policies and enforce them, management has to be informed of the various kinds of threats that face the organization. They have to know the threats that face the applications, the data, the information system. So what is a threat? A threat is an object, a person, or another entity that represents a constant danger to an asset. By examining each threat category in turn, management effectively protects its information through policy, education and training, and technology controls. There are all kinds of threats to business. This is a chart that came from, let's see, the uh, infographic from the Cyber Threat Defense Report. I just liked it because it was a, a catchy infographic here. And we see one of the things there in the middle, uh, one of the most recent uh, serious threats that people are concerned about is ransomware because it's emerged over the last year as an increasingly dangerous threat to organizations. And uh, uh, we see uh, uh, you know, things like obstacles, low security awareness, lack of skilled personnel, too much data analyzed. These are all things that people see as threats to business. So let's look at the results of, the, of some information from a couple of reports. And by the way, on Blackboard, you'll also find a whole slew of 2017 uh, cybersecurity reports, okay? They all take slightly different approaches to looking at uh, threats to organizations and how they may go about countering them. But these are some that we know. Um, the 2017 cyber, cyber Threat Defense Report found that nearly four in five, that is 79% of those responding to the survey, uh, were affected by a successful cyber attack in 2016, with a full third being breached six or more times in the span of a year. Uh, six in ten respondents said their organization was affected by ransomware in 2016, and it's gotten considerably worse in 2017, with a full third electing to pay the ransom to get their data back. So ransomware is working, you know. Um, more than 85% of the organizations allocate over 5% of their IT budgets for security, while six out of ten, 60%, uh, allocate over 10%. So security has become a significant proportion of the information technology budgets within organizations. It found that attacks ranked by security professionals overall concern, number one, malware, number two, phishing attacks, which is essentially uh, a method of what we call social engineering, uh, insider threats, uh, advanced persistent threats and targeted attacks, ransomware, web applications and secure socket layer attacks, zero day attacks, and denial of service attacks. Denial of service attacks have a big visible surface area, and it's what a lot of people think of when they think of organizations countering security threats, but you notice it's actually at the bottom of the list there, okay? Because they just don't happen all that often. The 2016 State of Cybercrime report found that 47% reported that an insider incident was committed against their organization. So people within the organization may present a significant component of threat. 30% reported that incidents caused by insider attacks were more costly or damaging than outsider attacks. So there are 12 categories of threats to information security. Uh, these are widely accepted. You find them reprinted all kinds of places. And they were actually written by one of the authors of our books way, way back, published it in one of the ACM journals. Uh, and the categories of threats, and we're gonna talk more in depth about each of these. Uh, compromises to intellectual property, and I'm just gonna go through the slides. But you can see they're, they're all on one page. It's in your book, it's in the slides. Uh, but let's talk about them. Compromises to intellectual property, deviations in quality of service from service providers, espionage or trespass, forces of nature, human error or failure, information extortion, sabotage or vandalism, software attacks, technical hardware uh, failures or errors, technical software failures or errors, technological obsolescence, and theft. So let's 
talk about each of these. Compromise of intellectual property. Many organizations in today's world uh, create or support the development of intellectual property as a part of their business operations. Uh, intellectual property is an enormous, uh, I will say it's an enormous a part of American industry. They think they are. When you actually measure it, they're considerably smaller, but they, they, it carries an enormous ripple effect of influence throughout the world, okay? Particularly things like the motion picture industry. Obviously, there are more movies being made in the United States than anywhere else. Is that true? No, it's false. Where are more movies made? India. A whole lot more movies are made in India, okay? But they're in 12 different languages, and, you know, they, they aren't going to have quite the influence because... Over the years, English has become a predominant language, and you know, so it means that our movies go everywhere. Um, but it's not just things like that. It's trade secrets, okay? What's the biggest trade secret? Number one best-known trade secret in the world? I mean, nobody knows a secret, but everybody knows that it, that it is a secret. What's that? Anybody got an idea? Coca-Cola, that's exactly right. The formula of Coca-Cola, which they claim is in a vault at the Coca-Cola Museum in Atlanta. I don't believe it's really in the vault. Uh, it's a big vault, too. I've seen it. Uh, but trade secrets, okay? Some people choose to protect their business integrity through trade secrets. I'll tell you one trade secret. Anybody who makes coatings, we used to call it paint, but today it's not paint. It's coatings, Okay. How many American coding companies have their coatings made overseas? Anybody know? Zero, okay? Because the minute you have your coatings made overseas, they make it sell it under another brand name. And what goes into your coating is typically a trade secret. So, you know, things like that. Uh, copyrights, obviously, copyrights protect intellectual property like music and motion pictures and books and many things like that. Trademarks protect the ability of an organization to do business by identifying that organization in the particular area of business that they're engaged in, okay? Uh, some people get ridiculous about trademarks. Uh, Monster uh, Cable Company that makes computer cables and audio cables, they'll sue everybody who puts Monster in their name. They sued a, a miniature golf course in New England for being Monster Miniature Golf. Does anyone in their right mind think that people are going to confuse, uh, confuse a miniature golf course with a cable company? No. Did they, did they, did they sue uh, Monster Energy? No, because Monster Energy Inc. has money. So they only bully people who don't have enough money to fight back. Okay, so they didn't sue Monster.com. They didn't sue Monster Energy Drink. But, and, and, and all of these people they bully could fight back, but it costs a lot of money. And so it's... It's easier just to change your name because it's not cheap. Uh, trademark bullies. Trademark bullies, yeah. There are patents, and there are a lot of patent bullies too. Patents, of course, protect an invention for around 20 years. Um, and patents expire, which is a good thing. Uh, so intellectual property is protected by copyright and other laws. It carries expectation of proper attribution or credit to its source. Uh, potentially requires the acquisition of permission for its use, as is specified in those laws. So uh, the unauthorized appropriation of intellectual property actually constitutes a threat to information security. The category includes uh, two primary areas, software piracy and copyright protection and user registration. Um, so uh, the most common... Uh, intellectual property breaches involve software, music, and video piracy. Um, and there are some watchdog organizations that investigate this. Excuse me. The Software and Information Industry Association and BSA, the Software Alliance. BSA used to stand for Business Software Alliance, but now they're BSA, the Software Alliance. I don't know why. I don't know why. Uh, the Recording Industry Association of America and the Motion Picture Association of America. It's important to recognize that most, in, in most instances, compromise of a copyright, for example, uh, of most intellectual property of any kind is a civil crime and not criminal acts. Uh, so copying a movie, despite the fact that the Motion Picture Association of America will tell you it's stealing, is not theft. Okay? Theft is a violation of criminal law. Uh, copying a movie is a copyright violation. It's a civil crime. 
Um, enforcement of copyright is now often attempted with technical security mechanisms. Uh, because of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, circumvention of technical copyright protection mechanisms is a criminal act. Um, so if you, you know, uh, yeah, use any way that you can, there are many ways you can circumvent uh, encrypt, it, 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 technically protect, protected systems, but it is, it becomes a criminal act. It effectively criminalizes copyright violations in the realm of digital media. And there's virtually no prosecutions. Why? Why don't they prosecute people for it? Because the law probably isn't going to stand up constitutionally in a lot of cases. So, Okay, moving on. Deviations in quality of service. This is situations where the product or services that are required for information technology to function within an organization are not delivered as expected. Uh, Information systems within an organization depend on many interdependent support systems. Support systems can be interrupted by severe weather, by employee illnesses, or a whole variety of other unforeseen events. So categories of this threat are uh, internet service issues, uh, communications and other service provider issues, and power irregularities. Um, the loss of internet service is a big one because it can lead to a considerable loss in the availability of information. And remember, that's one of our important aspects of information security. Um, so internet service uh, is, is an issue there. Uh, organizations very often will have sales staffs and telecommuters who work at remote locations, and they, it really impacts their ability to engage in business uh, and ensure that data that it, and information that is necessary is available. Um, when an organization outsources its web servers, which is not uncommon, normally the outsourcer assumes responsibility for all internet services and the hardware and operating system software used to operate the website. We're going to look more at the concept of outsourcing and how that contributes or detracts from information security. Uh, communications and other services. There are a whole variety of utility services that have potential impact. Among these are the telephone, okay, uh, water and wastewater, trash pickup, cable television, natural or propane gas, custodial services. A loss of threat, a threat of loss of services can lead to an organization's inability to function properly. Okay, and you go, well, gee, custodial services, you know. Well, if uh, you collect too much dust, you get dust contamination issues for information systems. I know it's a kind of an extreme example, but it's entirely possible. Power irregularities are a serious issue. Voltage levels can increase, decrease, or cease. You can have a spike, it's a momentary increase, a surge, a prolonged increase, sag, a momentary low voltage, a brownout, a prolonged drop, fault, momentary loss of power, blackout, prolonged loss, and electronic equipment is very susceptible to fluctuations. So we can actually apply technical controls to manage power quality. One of the things that uh, plagues us as the School of Applied Technology occasionally is a lot of our server assets are out at the Rice Campus in Wheaton. Power in Wheaton, Illinois sucks. Okay, and we have a, a, a completely unacceptable number of power interruptions out there. And sometimes they're blackouts, you know, sometimes they go on for several hours. Sometimes they are literally just faults. And I have seen faults in my office. You know, the lights click off, they click back on, and anything that's not on a UPS pff, reboots. You know, and it's not a good thing. Okay, moving on to, uh, we're, we're working through this threat, and we're just talking a list of threats, and we're talking a little bit about each of them. Uh, espionage or trespass. Uh, this is a broad category of activities that, uh, uh, both electronic and human activities that can be used to breach the confidentiality of information. Uh, it includes unauthorized accessing of information, uh, and uh, one of the things that we have to look at is there is a difference between competitive intelligence collection and espionage. Espionage, in, in this context, uh, constitutes illegal acts. 
um, a few years ago, many years ago, actually very, very early in the days of, uh, of the World Wide Web, um, Motorola, which was still pretty big in those days before they broke up into pieces and sold pieces off and this and that, uh, hired somebody away from the CIA who was a CIA analyst to be their director of corporate intelligence. I met him. He was, he was pretty sharp. He, in turn, went out and found somebody to uh, build a competitive intelligence collection system for him. And it was actually an <laughs> interesting deal. A kid who was 15 years old who was writing competitive intelligence collection code for Motorola. And he wrote code that what it did was it crawled all of their uh, competitors' websites and pulled down all the skill sets associated with job postings. Because if you analyzed all those skill sets, you could figure out what kind of projects they were working on. Well, that's entirely legal competitive intelligence collection. But if at the same time the 15-year-old had gone ahead and broken into the HR computer systems, you know, and pulled that information, now we've edged over into espionage, which is illegal activity. Uh, one of the things that people do that you don't think of is something called shoulder surfing. And that is somebody just looking over your shoulder. That can occur any place that someone is accessing confidential information. Okay, They can look and pick up your PIN number at an ATM terminal, or they can watch your password being typed in. Um, controls that are sometimes implemented to mark the boundaries of an organization's virtual territory and give notice to trespassers that they're encroaching on the organization's cyberspace. Government's big about this. You see that on many federal government websites. But what happens is that typically hackers will use skill, guile, or fraud to steal the property of somebody else. Um, Password attacks uh, are one of these things that are used. It falls under the, the category of espionage or trespass, just as lock picking falls under the category of breaking and entering. Uh, attempting to guess or reverse calculate a password is very often called cracking, and there are many approaches to uh, password cracking. It include These include brute force, which is an application of computer and network resources to try every possible password combination. Uh, and dictionary attacks, which is a brute force pass pa attack that narrows the field by using a dictionary of common passwords and information that may be related to the target user. Um, approaches to password cracking includes uh, rainbow tables, which is a database of hash values and their unencrypted equivalents against which an encrypted password file can be compared. Um, and social engineering, which is where we have attackers who pose as employees to try to gain access to information, to systems information, by asking employees for their usernames and passwords. They'll call on the phone and they'll go, yeah, this is the help desk. Uh, there's an issue with your machine in your office. Uh, can you verify your username and password for us so that we can ensure that uh, everything's okay with it? Uh, and then they use that information to gain access to organizational systems. So. Um, Right? So shoulder surfing, you know, uh, people can do it with passwords. That's why if you, if you have a computer that processes sensitive information, you should never be operating it in a place where someone can peer over your shoulder. Um, I have no sensitive information on my computer. so uh, and, and then ATM machines, uh, it is pretty solidly uh, observed thing in the United States where you have ATM machines in populated places that people will stand back, okay, to show that they're not trying to look at your... Uh, it's interesting in Union Station because the ATM in Union Station is very poorly placed um, because it's right in the middle of the concourse connecting all of the, all of the, the train uh, uh, tracks and... and uh, it's hard for people to stand in line, you know, six feet away so as not to look over your shoulder. Hackers over the years have changed a lot. Uh, hackers uh, originally, people, their perspective of hackers was that they were, you know, males 18 to 13 to 18 years old with limited parental supervision who spent all their free time on the computer hacking. Uh, in the early days of, uh, of networking, uh, my, one of my son's friends was one of these kids. He used to do this on... AOL, 
Uh, he actually got his family banned from AOL for two months one time uh, because uh, of his hacking online. But today, a hacker, what's a hacker today? Oh, we have no clue. Uh, anybody age 12 to 60, I'm older than 60, so they could be older. Uh, male or female, unknown background, varying technological skills. Uh, they can be internal or external to the organization. You have no idea today who these people are. Um, hackers are people with generally uh, two skill levels that we see. Uh, the first is the expert hacker who develops software scripts and will code exploits. Uh, very often these people are masters of, of many skills. Uh, they seem to live in Baltic countries very often. I don't know why that is, or Bulgaria. Um, they, they will create attack software and they'll share it with other people. And then we have a category of script kiddies. These are hackers, they have very limited skills. They use expert written software, written by the expert hackers, to exploit a system. And very often they don't even fully understand the systems that they're, that they're hacking. Does that make them less dangerous? No, okay? Because they're using good tools and they're just as likely to get into systems in many cases, as the skilled hackers. Um, other terms for uh, system rule breakers, you sometimes see cracker, which is uh, most specifically applied to an individual who cracks or removes protection that's designed to prevent unauthorized duplication. Um, people, <laughs> over the years, computer-based uh, uh, games have used all kinds of amazing complex schemes to keep people from cracking the, the, to keep people from uh, copying the game. And the most complex scheme currently in use uh, typically is cracked within four hours. Okay, so the, the tools are not really useful uh, as, as far as protecting because the crackers are so good. Uh, they just inconvenience uh, other people trying to make use of the software. Uh, another term that we used to see a lot, freaker, these were people who hacked the public telephone network back when the public telephone network was acoustic. Now that it's digital, you know, don't hear the term freaker a whole lot anymore. Uh, another big issue, and this relates very quickly, very strongly to an area of cybersecurity that we look at as something called contingency response, disaster recovery, business continuity, are forces of nature. They're sometimes called force majeure, or they don't use this. They used to use this term in insurance, acts of God. And it's like people say, you know, God doesn't do those nasty things. They just happen. Now, these are dangerous because in many cases they occur with little warning and they're beyond control. Uh, this includes civil disorder and acts of war. They can disrupt not only the lives of individuals, but... Uh, the storage, transmission, and use of information. Acts of forces of nature includes fire, flood, earthquake, lightning, landslides, tornadoes and hurricanes, as well as volcanic eruption and insect infestations. Yeah, literal computer bugs. Um, what's the most common of those? Guesses, the most common of those? Fire. Okay, fire. Fire presents the biggest threat to most enterprises, and people don't necessarily think about that, but it really does. It's the most common of those to occur, and uh, um, what, what area that's technologically intensive and has a great deal to do with the technology industry in the United States is under constant danger of volcanic eruption. Redmond, Spokane, Seattle, okay. Mount Rainier is an active volcano. And if it ever erupts, oh my gosh, it's going to wreak havoc with that whole region, okay? Um, I'm hoping that everybody there has, you know, good plans for that. But. Management has to implement controls to limit damage and prepare contingency plans for continued operations. Uh, forces of nature can, be, can only be mitigated through insurance, uh, although f careful facilities design and placement can reduce the likelihood of damage, okay? Uh, for example, if I were running a data center in New Orleans, I think I would put everything like 12 feet above uh, the ground. <laughs> you know, the ground floor of my data center would be raised considerably to keep everything above high highest expected flood levels from hurricanes. 
Okay, acts of human error or failure. This include acts done with no malicious intent, that is, mistakes, okay? These are caused by inexperience, by improper training, by incorrect assumptions, by failure to follow policies, uh, and by other circumstances. Employees are the greatest threats to information security uh, because they are threat agents closest to the organizational data. Uh, employee mistakes very often can lead to any of the following circumstances. Uh, revealing of classified data, entry of erroneous data, which, what, compromises integrity, right? Accidental deletion or modification of data, uh, storage of data in unprotected areas, and failure to protect information. Many of these threats can be prevented with training, uh, ongoing awareness activities, and controls. So the question is, you know, who is the greatest threat to your organization? Is it uh, Tom Two-Story, a convicted burglar? Is it Daryl Davis, the wannabe amateur hacker? Or is it Harriet Althums, the employee who accidentally deleted the only copy of a critical report? You know? Um, some typical human error or failure attacks include the following. Social engineering. This is where people, the guys who call you on the phone and say, hey, I'm from tech support and we need your username and password. And people do give them. Um, advanced, something called advanced fee fraud. Phishing, which is email that you get that uh, asks you to verify things. Uh, and they manipulate URLs. They forge websites entirely sometimes. So, you, you know, go, you go to a website that you're directed to by this phishing email, and it looks like the real Citibank website, you know, and but it's not. <laughs> uh, spear phishing, which is phishing that specifically targets individuals by name. Um, Pretexting. I don't even know what that is. It's from the book. I need, I obviously I need to read that. Uh, the role of computer, human computer interface design, uh, is one of the things, every once in a while, uh, you'll see some things that come out of left field. Why? And that aren't in the textbook. Because we're required to do these as part of our being a national center of academic excellence in cyber defense. Okay, national, yeah, national, Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense. Uh, that's the federal government, and they require us to address certain issues. One of those issues is human computer interface design. Human computer interface design, however, is significant in the reduction of error. Why? Because proper human computer interface design helps really reduce errors. That's one of the main goals of, of HCI, or UX as it's often called today. I can provide improved authentication process and methods. And clear labeling and consistent interface control placement reduces uh, errors by end users. The, it improves the use of security tools and implementation through better usability. Now I had a video that uh, I used to describe this video or this, this snippet of a, of a television show because it's so applicable and I actually was able to get a decent copy of it. Um, so I have my big disclaimer down there saying, hey, this is fair use. Um, yeah, but uh, this is a, a piece of video from the television series Monk. And uh, before I run this, I'm going to I'm going to adjust my speaker volume here because it's probably too loud. We'll see. Let's see. That's probably about right, right there. Okay. The victim is a female Caucasian, 20 to 25 years of age. All four extremities have been severed at a 45 degree angle, posterior to anterior. She's older. Pardon me? She's at least 26. She was raised in one of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, probably Lithuania. Anything else? No, that's it. Except the killer was a mountain climber, very experienced, and uh, he was left hand. You can tell all of that from this. Well, that scar on her upper arm is from a smallpox vaccination. It was common in the Baltic states. They stopped vaccinating in 1978. She had to have been born before then. What about mountain climber? The fiber rope and the knot. I believe it's called a Prusik knot. Mountain climbers use it. And it's tied with the top loop uh, facing right. So, of course, it's left-handed. 
Of course. Um. What? Well, I'm, uh... Oh my God! What did you do? There were there were some crumbs in the. Uh, I, I, my case files. You've deleted all of them. Sorry. Is it true? He deleted ten years worth of forensic files. Yes, sir. It was an accident. He's an accident. This is indefensible, Captain. Look, the files were almost all backed up. They're trying to retrieve them now. I don't care. The man is toast. He'll never work for this department, with this department, or in this department again. <laughs> I love that. It's, I mean, it's such a good example of human error, you know? Um, and, and I like Tony Shalhoub, too. He plays that character so well. Um, my, uh, my eldest son is an actor. And uh, because he's an actor, what does that mean? It means he works at Starbucks. Because uh, that's what actors do when they don't have a... a you know, paying gig. So he worked at Starbucks in in uh, in uh, no, uh, Lincoln Center in New York in Manhattan. And Tony Shalhoub came used to come in and buy coffee. And he got the opportunity to sit down with Tony Shalhoub and talk about acting, which is kind of cool. His uh, his very first customer there was Kevin Bacon. So I only have one degree of separation from from Kevin Bacon. Uh, information extortion, also known as cyber extortion, is where an attacker or a formerly trusted insider steals information from a computer system and demands compensation for its return or non-use. Biggest thing that people do typically is they steal credit card information. And then they'll say, you know, hey, I'm going to release this onto, onto, you know, BB, bulletin board systems or whatever if, uh, if you don't pay the ransom. Uh, extortion, very often credit card theft. That's where we see it a lot. Recent uh, information extortion attacks have involved specialized forms of malware called ransomware. And, of course, ransomware will encrypt the user's data and offer to unlock it if the user pays the attacker. And then they may not even bother to do that. Uh, information extortion is interesting. We saw a big instance of this uh, with... Uh, Ashley Madison, uh, some of you may be too young to recall this, but a lot of you uh, might. Uh, this is a, uh, was a website devoted for people who wanted to cheat on their spouse. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's what it was all about. It's, life is short, have an affair. Um, and uh, someone stole all the, the customer list from Ashley Madison and held Ashley Madison for ransom and said, if you don't pay, we're going to release. They didn't pay, they released the list. Lots of people had spouses who were unhappy. You know, is that information extortion or is that sabotage? <laughs> it's kind of a kind of an interesting question. Uh, that's our next category: sabotage or vandalism. Uh, deliberate acts of sabotage or vandalism. We see that a lot of people uh, today will assault the electronic face of an organization, the website. So. People who engage in this are an individual or group who want to deliberately sabotage the operations of a computer system or business or perform acts of vandalism to either destroy an asset or damage the image of the organization. Threats can range from petty vandalism to, to organized sabotage. Uh, organizations very much rely on their image, so web defacing can erode consumer confidence, uh, diminish sales, uh, hurt their net worth, and the reputation of the organization. Uh, there's a rising threat also of hacktivists or cyber activist operations, of which the most extreme version, and this is one that's a, become a major concern, is cyber terrorism, where people could hack infrastructure, for example, and destroy electrical systems or release water from dams or things like that. Uh, there is some... A uh, positive online activism, but it's uh, you need to be aware that uh, there are certainly things that uh, present a threat. Um, one of my favorite stories about the uh, fairly early days of the web is the U.S. Army had their website hacked, um, and uh, you know, somebody replaced the pages with stuff basically saying, "Yeah, yeah, we have, we know we hacked your website," and uh, the Army's response. I'm sorry, I was in the Navy, so we make fun of the Army a lot, you know. And this is, a, I'm like, this is such a classic Army response. Instead of tightening the security on their systems, they said, oh, we'll replace all our servers with Macs, because nobody hacks into Macs. And, and, and that's what they did. I mean, it was like, 
Oh, come on, guys. That's, that's not the right answer. But it was like, that was like, I don't know, quite a while ago. That's probably 16, 18 years ago now. Um, deliberate software attacks. Uh, this is when an individual or group designs uh, software to attack systems and they create uh, malicious code or software that is collectively called malware. There are a lot of different kinds of malware. I mean, malware has been around almost as long as people have had the ability to, put, to move a file from one computer to another. Uh, in the very, very early days of personal computing, uh, malware, the, the common malware were boot sector viruses that would take over the boot sector of your computer. And uh, this was back in the days when the, uh, Eastern Europe was still under, as, as they used to call it, the communist yoke. You know, they were all communist countries. And an enormous amount of boot sector viruses used to come out of Bulgaria. And Bulgaria, of all the communist countries, because of the nature of their particular leader, was far and away the most backwards country. And we used to joke about it. We used to say, what, there's four computers in Bulgaria, and there's guys lined up waiting to write their, write their boot sector viruses on those computers. Uh, it was always a mystery how all these boot sector viruses seem to uh, originate in Bulgaria. But, uh, of course, malware today is considerably more sophisticated and continues to evolve and change as time goes by. Um, malware is designed to damage, damage, destroy, gain access, or deny service to target systems. And I've seen malware change enormously over the years. People used to use it to hijack systems to do all kinds of things with. Uh, today, people use it to hijack systems to mount distributed denial of service attacks. And one of the most recent, really nasty DDoSs, people hijacked what? Video cameras. They hijacked uh, surveillance cameras because the software protection uh, on those is like basically non-existent. And it was very easy to hijack all those and use those as tools. Um, so it's all kinds of malware. Deployment of malware is a criminal act always, but the problem with it is it's prosecutable only to the extent that, that uh, it results in demonstrable financial loss to the victim. What do you think, uh, how much financial loss do you think you got to have in the Chicago area to get a prosecutor to prosecute somebody for uh, attacking your, your information system? Any guesses? What? How much? Guesses? No. Oh, what? I'm sorry? That's exactly right. It is 50000 Yeah. So if you want to steal money from somebody online, bear in mind, if you do 48000 you're probably okay. Yeah, don't, don't, don't take my word for that. But, but seriously, essentially, if people cannot demonstrate a financial loss of greater than $50,000, prosecutors don't view it as being worth their time. Okay. Uh, and in many cases, the, the big problem is that the people who are mounting these types of things are not in places where you can prosecute them. They're in Latvia. They're in Lithuania. You know, they're in Bulgaria. Um, so deliberate software and tax includes a whole variety of threats to systems. Macroviruses, boot viruses, worms, Trojan horses, polymorphic threats, hoaxes, logic bombs. One of my favorite hoax viruses, uh, in Windows 98, there was a system file called suffinblock.exe, S-U-F-N-B-L-K.exe. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, even though it's a system file, Microsoft made the icon a teddy bear. So it was easy to convince people that it was malware. So there, there were all these emails going around saying, you have to check, if you're running Windows 98, you better check your system. And if you find this at suffinblock.exe, you better delete it. And then part of your operating system wouldn't operate properly. Okay? Uh, there were a lot of variants on these hoax viruses, some spoofs, one I really loved because I, I went to the Naval Academy and uh, the service academies all have honor codes or honor concepts. And there was one called the West Point virus. And the West Point virus was an email that you got and it said, you have just been, you have just received the West Point virus 
you are bound by your honor to delete all information from your hard drive. Uh, and then there's another one called the Amish. These are spoofs, uh, but these are kind of fun. The Amish virus. So you just received the Amish virus. You have to take the hard drive out of your computer and take it out behind your barn and, and uh, use a five-pound sledgehammer to uh, obliterate it. But, uh, I mean, those are jokes. But the hoaxes, there are a lot of uh, virus hoaxes that people spend a lot of time and money on uh, that are serious threats. Why? Because they engage people into working to deal with this th quote-unquote threat that isn't even a threat at all. It's just a hoax. And so there are a lot of these software attacks. Uh, it also includes uh, uh, back doors, trap doors, maintenance hooks, uh, denial of service attacks, distributed denial of service attacks, spam, mail bomb, social engineering attacks, packet sniffers, spoofing, farming, man-in-the-middle attacks like TCP hijacking or session hijacking. Uh, you know, they, they're, there's just a ton of these. Um, so we will talk more about those, but that's a big threat. Technical hardware error failures or errors. This occurs when a manufacturer uh, distributes to users equipment that contains flaws. Okay, defects. These defects can cause systems to perform outside of expected parameters, which could result in unreliable service or a lack of availability of the system. So those are, uh, in, in hardware terms, failures are measured uh, in mean time between failure and mean time to failure. Um, mean time between failure presumes that the item can be repaired or returned to service. Uh, mean time to failure assumes that when it fails, the item has to be repaired. Placed. Um, from a repair standpoint, uh, mean time um, between failures equals uh, mean time uh, to failure plus mean, uh, blah, 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 mean time to diagnose, MTTDD, uh, which examines diagnosis time, and then MTTR, mean time to repair. So, you know, we combine all those to, to determine our uh, mean time between failures. Um, and uh, we find, though, that even though ideally we should always be able to fix issues, very often we can't. Some errors are terminal and that they just result in unrecoverable loss of equipment. And that does occur. Some areas and these errors, and these are the worst hardware errors, is they're intermittent and they only periodically manifest themselves and you get faults that can't easily be repeated. So you're trying to write a trouble ticket, say it does this, the guy comes to look at it, gal comes to look at it, and it doesn't do it. You know, it's like everything's working fine. Yeah, well, it didn't work yesterday and it doesn't work tomorrow. Uh, I have one of these bizarre ones on my desktop computer in my office. Uh, if I go away for a weekend very often, I will come back on, on Tuesday, because I work Mondays at the Rice Campus, I'll come back on Tuesday, and I'm connected to the network, and I can actually access my computer externally. I can, I can you know, do remote desktop into the computer, but I can't access anything on the Internet, except Google. Except Google. I don't get that. <laughs> and and to, to fix it, I don't know what fixes it. Typically, I have to reboot four times, and I have to move my network cable from one network adapter to the other, like two or three times, and then it'll just start working again. I don't know what causes it. I don't know, you know why it happens. I do know how to fix it, but it takes about two hours to fix it. It's really annoying. That's a technical hardware. I don't know if it's even a hardware or maybe a software error. Uh, technical software failures or errors come from revealing software with unrevealed faults. Some people, you know, sell software with unrevealed faults. Microsoft. Uh, pardon my cough. Uh, uh, what we see is that large quantities of computer code are written, debugged, published, and sold only to determine that, oh, sorry, all the bugs weren't resolved. We thought they were all gone. But uh, sometimes... And this is what happens, too, is that unique combinations of certain software and hardware will reveal new bugs, okay? Hey, this worked fine until you installed it on this computer with this processor and this hard drive. Uh, and now, hmm, yeah, that doesn't work, does it? Oh, well. 
Um, sometimes uh, these items aren't errors. Sometimes they're purposeful shortcuts left by programmers for honest or dishonest reasons. Uh, dishonest reasons, they're called trapdoors. Honest reasons, they're called backdoors, but backdoors still very often have no, uh, no there's no valid reason for it. Uh, among the most popular bug tracking websites is Bug Track, ho hosted by Security Focus. Uh, it provides up to the minute information on the latest security vulnerabilities, as well as a thorough archive of past bugs. So people do try to track these things. Okay, every bug has the potential to be a vulnerability. A vulnerability means there's a weakness that can be exploited, which means people can attack your system successfully. Okay, so. That's, uh, that's the issue there. Technical software failure, uh, the uh, Open Web uh, Application Security Project listed the 10 most critical web application security risks for 2013, just as an example. Uh, injection, SQL injection attacks, broken authentication, and session management, cross-site scripting, insecure direct object references, security misconfiguration, sensitive data exposure, missing function level access control, cross-site request forgery, using components with known vulnerabilities, unvalidated redirects and forwards. So, you know, these are all these kind of things. These constitute the web application sins, SQL injection, uh, web server related vulnerabilities, web client related vulnerabilities, cross-site scripting, uh, use of uh, magic URLs, predictable cookies, hidden form fields, all things that, uh, you know, uh, these are implementation sins of software security. Uh, buffer overruns, format string problems, integer, integer overflows, C++ catastrophes, catching exceptions, command injection, fair to handle errors correctly, information leakage, race conditions, poor usability, not updating easily, executing code with too much privilege, fair to protect stored data, uh, uh, sins of mobile code, cryptographic sins, use of weak password-based systems, uh, weak random number generation, and using the wrong cryptography. Uh, random number generation would seem like it's a no-brainer, but honestly, a lot of random number generators are just really bad, okay? Um, for those of you who are serious coders, I know we've got one good application developer. You probably have dealt with that, you know? I mean, you have to, you have to do a lot of iterations to come up with a, a reasonable um, simulation of randomness. And that's all you're doing. You cannot create truly random numbers. And some systems are just really bad at it. I have a, on my iPad here, I have a, uh, uh, a solitaire game I really like to play, but it's not a very good random number generator that executes the cards. So you have to play strategy that takes that into account. So I will only start games with certain uh, card combinations showing because I know that because of the way it generates the random numbers, I'm probably, there's probably not a winnable game unless I see particular sets because I've been playing it for a long time. Uh, if they had a better random number generator, it would be like playing real solitaire, which is really genuinely random, okay? Um, networking sins, failure to protect network traffic, improper use of, uh, of, uh, of uh, encryption systems, uh, public key infrastructure, especially secure sockets layer, uh, trusting network name resolution, all kinds of pieces, okay? Just some ideas of examples of software security issues. Technological obsolescence. Uh, this includes uh, use of antiquated or outdated infrastructure. It can lead to unreliable or untrustworthy systems. When technology becomes outdated, there's a risk of loss of data integrity to threats and attacks. And what did we see recently? What? We saw a, a, a particular ransomware that did what? Target Windows XP systems, right? because people had failed to turn off a very vulnerable form of server message block, which is how Windows file sharing functions. So there's three different versions of SMB. SMB 1, 2, 3, I got it. and it all exploited vulnerabilities in SMB 1. As long as you turned SMB 1 off, you were fine, okay? Who still legally uses Windows XP? Does anybody know? Supported by Microsoft. No, no, he's probably not supported by Microsoft. Uh, right, yeah? 
Def oh, yeah, some of the... No, those are not supported by Microsoft, though. They're just running Windows XP, so they're completely <laughs> insecure. Now, the United States Navy, actually, uh, still runs Windows XP, supported by Microsoft, but only until the end of this year, I believe. Uh, ideally, proper planning by management should prevent the risk of obsolescence. But when obsolescence is identified, management has to take action because obsolescence systems almost invariably are vulnerable systems. Uh, the most significant case in recent years, as we talked about, is Windows XP. There's still lots of people running Windows XP despite the fact that it's no longer supported by Microsoft and is very vulnerable. Uh, deliberate acts of theft. This is taking uh, of another's property, physical, electronic, or intellectual. The value of information is always going to suffer if it's copied and taken away without the owner's knowledge. So physical theft can be controlled. We have a whole variety of measures we can make use of, from locked doors to guards or alarm systems. Uh, but electronic theft is a lot more difficult to manage and control because organizations, in many cases, will have no idea that it's happened. Okay, as long as nothing is disturbed within the data, they have no way of knowing that someone has came, has come and copied all that data out. Okay, um, theft is uh, very often an overlapping category with software attacks, with espionage or trespass, with information extortion, and with compromises to intellectual property. So those those things all are, are other threats that that overlap with this one. Uh, increasingly, we see these deliberate acts of theft as a, a pretty serious problem. We've seen it recently with uh, Target, uh, with Home Depot, where people stole credit card information, where uh, iCloud image storage, where people came and took everybody's nude selfies and posted them online. Uh, and, you know, but so it's, it's, a, it's an issue. Okay, moving on to a new topic, management. Uh, that's because this, pro this course is, of course, cybersecurity management. So we're going to talk a little bit about what management is. Um, some of you have taken management courses. Some of you will take management courses. Just bear with me, okay? What is management? Management is the process of, of achieving uh, objectives using a given set of resources. It's important to recognize that management is always constrained by the resources that are available. A manager is a member of, of an organization that is assigned to marshal and administer those resources, to coordinate the completion of tasks within the organization, and to handle all the roles that are necessary to complete the desired organization. Uh, I'm sorry, the desired objectives of the organization. That's what management does. Managerial roles include an informational role because managers have to collect, process, and use information that can affect the completion of the objective. Managers also have an interpersonal role. Managers have to interact with superiors. They have to work with their subordinates. They have to interact with outside stakeholders and other parties uh, that, are, that either are going to influence or are going to be influenced by completion of the task at hand. And managers have a decisional role. They, they have to select from alternative approaches and resolve conflicts, dilemmas, or challenges. What, a lot of people view this as the most important aspect of management, the decisional role. That's, that's the thing that sets manage. Most people in a job, in their working life, have some informational role. They have some interpersonal role. But many people don't necessarily have a decisional role. Or the decisions they make are relatively trivial. You know, uh, managers very often have to make decisions that can, uh, in some cases, make or break the entire organization. Um, one of the, I, I, I like to cite this example. What particular job role in the armed forces has the highest qualifications for test, test all the tests that you take to, to enlist in the service? Anybody know? Anybody know? Yeah. Navy SEALs. Why? No. The reason for it is, if you're a second-class petty officer as a Navy SEAL and you're doing a mission, you may actually be called upon to make a decision that affects the security of the entire United States. 
And that's why they expect those guys to be pretty. Everybody thinks of them as big, buff, you know, hard charging guys. They got to be pretty damn smart too, and that's the reason for it. Okay, so that decisional role is is in many senses the key piece of management. That's what sets managers apart from other employees more than anything else. There is a difference between leadership and management too, and and. Organizations ideally have people that are leaders, not just managers. A leader, uh, it will influence employees so they're willing to accomplish objectives. A leader is expected to lead by example and demonstrate personnel traits, personal traits, I'm sorry, that instill a desire to follow in others. Leaders provide purpose, direction, and motivation to the people that follow the leader. Uh, a manager, on the other hand, administers the resources of the organization, creates budgets, authorizes expenditures, hires employees, and effective managers can be effective leaders. Some of you may have worked for managers who are terrible leaders, okay? Uh, they might still be good in the very narrow management role into which they're cast because most of their management activities consist of administering resources, creating budgets, authorizing expenditures, uh, making decisions, okay, but not relying heavily on how they're going to interact with subordinates. People who are leaders are the people who interact extremely well with their subordinates, and people who are leaders are the people who get things out of people. Um, some people who historically have been le lately tarred, you know, as Thomas Edison is an example. Thomas Edison, a lot of people say, you know, he didn't do 90% of the things he got credit for, yeah, but they, but they were people who worked for him who did, and he led them to that. Thomas Edison, for whatever reason, appears to have been a pretty darn inspiring leader. You know, Elon Musk gets enormous things out of people. Why? Because Elon Musk is not just a manager, he's a leader. And that's what focuses what he does, a lot of what he does within the various businesses that he runs. Uh, behavioral types of leaders. There are three basic behavioral types of leaders. We have the autocratic leader. This is the person who is, hey, I'm in charge, you're gonna do what I say, okay? We have the democratic leader. This is the kind of leader who says, well, what do you guys think we should do, okay? And then you have the laissez-faire leader who says, well, you guys can do what you want. I'm okay with that, okay? now. There are times where leaders have to be any or all of these things, okay? Obviously, you can't be all at once. But a good leader, a good leader can exercise all these kinds of behavior, all these kinds of behavior. Uh, one of the things that uh, the laissez-faire uh, leader, the person who says, oh, you guys just do, do what you want, um, some, some very good leaders are this style of leader. How do they accomplish this? And I always describe this as, well, you hire the best people and get the hell out of their way, okay? Um, but that works. That's a perfectly good method. But it's contingent on uh, being able to do that. Man there are two basic approaches to management. We have the traditional management theory that uses the core principles of planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling, or postdoc as it's sometimes called, okay? And then uh, popular management theory uh, has emerged that categorizes the principles of management into planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, okay? Uh, and that's probably a little more predominant. And when you look at management theory today, you're more likely to see that. Uh, so when people talk about activities of management, they're either talking about the traditional management model, planning, organizing, staffing, directing, and controlling, or planning, organizing, leading, and controlling. Um, there are some unique functions of cybersecurity management that have been called the six P's. I always like these alliterative things like six P's. Uh, planning, policy, programs, protection, people, and project management. Uh, cybersecurity planning is important because planning uh, is an extension of the basic planning model uh, that's talked about earlier in the, in the chapter in the book. Uh, but included in the cybersecurity planning model are activities necessary to support the creation, I'm sorry, design, creation, and implementation of information security strategies as they exist within the information technology planning environment. 
Uh, there are a whole a lot of varieties of cybersecurity plans. And so that's why cybersecurity planning is such a critical function of cybersecurity management. Uh, and we have incident response planning, business continuity planning, disaster recovery planning, policy planning, personnel planning, technology rollout planning, risk management planning, and security program planning, uh, which includes education, training, and awareness. Uh, included in the cybersecurity planning model are activities that are necessary to support the design, creation, and implementation of information security strategies within the planning environments of all organizational units, including information technology. Because cybersecurity strategic plans have to support not only information technology use and the protection of information assets, but the, those of the entire organization, it's critical that the person in charge of security, usually the chief information security officer, must work closely with all the senior managers in developing cybersecurity strategy. What emerges from cybersecurity strategy is policy. Policy is a set of organizational guidelines that dictate certain behaviors within the organization. You can view them as organizational laws. Within cybersecurity, there are three general categories of policy. We have enterprise information security policy, or as it's now known, known in, in uh, a special publication 12 program policy, uh, issue-specific security policy, and system-specific security policies. Now, special publication 12 eliminated security in issue-specific and system-specific policy titles. So these are just some recent changes. Why do I mention them here? Because you'll see both sets of, of uh, descriptions in use for these three layers of policy. Uh, programs are cybersecurity operations that are specifically managed as separate entities. And we see a variety of these. A good example is a security education training and awareness program, CETA. That's one entity. Other programs may uh, include a physical security program, complete with fire, physical access, gates, guards, and so forth. Uh, the protection function in cybersecurity management is executed through a set of risk management activities, including risk assessment and control, as well as protection mechanisms, technologies, and tools. And each of these mechanisms represents some aspect of the management of specific controls within the overall cybersecurity plan. People, of course, are the most critical link in the information security program. And the, the, this area of cybersecurity includes security personnel and the security of personnel, as well as aspects of the security education, training, and awareness program we already mentioned. Uh, the final component of, of uh, cybersecurity management is the application of project, the project management discipline to all elements of the information security program. Project management involves identifying and controlling resources uh, that are going to be applied to a project, as well as measuring progress and adjusting the process as progress is made toward the goal. Now, one of the things that has emerged recently, um, and this is a federal requirement, so I'm talking about this, are maturity models. This is a process improvement approach that's based on process models that sort of break down the organization's uh, level of maturity into something that can be measured and categorized, okay? The first the maturity model, and probably the best known, is someone called the capability maturity model. And another one that's in very wide use is the software testing maturity model, which, by the way, was created by our dean, Bob Carlson, and his colleague, Eileen Bernstein, here at IIT. Um, maturity models are used to assess an organization against the scale of process maturity levels, usually three to five levels that they get judged against. Each level ranks the organization according to some standardization of processes in the subject area that's being assessed. Uh, the components of a maturity model are levels, and there are typically metrics associated with each level that allow us to measure how closely we are in alignment with that level. Levels are often defined for each process or activity, and specific components uh, will vary because not all the models are based on the capability maturity model. Um, some of these models include the building, in, building security in maturity model, which is a baseline method that describes software security initiatives at 67 well-known companies. 
It has 112 activities organized in 12 practices according to the software security framework. We have the software assurance maturity model, which is an open framework to formulate or implement a strategy uh, for software security that's tailored to specific risks that have been identified as facing the organization. We have the cybersecurity capability maturity model developed by the U.S. Department of Energy. Uh, it's a voluntary evaluation process using a set of industry accepted cybersecurity practices to measure the maturity of an organization's cybersecurity capabilities. And it provides what are called maturity indicator levels or MILs. Um, it works with the Department of Energy cybersecurity risk management process guideline. By the way, all these documents that I'm talking about, almost all of these, any from the government I probably am providing. Um, so here the, we see a, a, a spider diagram from the building security and maturity model that shows the level of security um, in each of these areas, um, the, the top 10 activities. Um, the goals of the building security and maturity model are to ensure that we have an informed, that we're making informed risk management decisions, that we have clarity on what, what is the right thing to do for everybody who's involved in security of software. This is specifically focused on software security. Uh, cost reduction through standard repeatable processes, that's always useful. That's a big tenant of software engineering. Why people believe in software engineering methodologies because in theory, uh, you will reduce costs through standard repeatable processes and it ideally improved, improved code quality. The software assurance maturity model is used for organizing, uh, I'm sorry, for evaluating an organization's existing software security practices and it's used to build a balanced software security program in a set of well defined iterations by demonstrating concrete improvements to a security assurance program. And it defines and measures security related activities within an organization. Uh, it has a mapping to the building security and maturity model, so you can make use of both. It has level zero, that's an implicit starting point representing activities being unfulfilled. Level one, initial understanding and ad hoc provision of security practices. Level two, increased efficiency and or effectiveness of the security practice. And level three, comprehensive mastery of the security practice at scale. The cybersecurity capability maturity model, we mentioned the fact that it uses something called maturity indicator levels or MILs. This includes a, a set of levels here, MIL zero, the practices are not performed. MIL one, initial practices are performed but may be done on an ad hoc basis. Mill two, practices are more complete or more advanced than mill one. Mill three, practices are more complete or more advanced than mill two. Um, but mill two and mill three have greater definition. So mill two is practices are documented, stakeholders are identified and involved, adequate resources are provided to support the process, and standards or guidelines are used to pre guide practice implementation. Uh, level three, mill three, activities are guided by policy or other directives and governance. Policies include compliance requirements for specified standards or guidelines. Activities are periodically reviewed for conformance to policy. And responsibility and authority for practices are assigned to personnel. Personnel performing the practice have require, uh, adequate skills and knowledge. That brings us to the end. One of the things that we need to know is that I am not going to stick around after class because I have to catch a bus so I can catch my train. Um, so um, typically the class ends at 9.05. I'll be out the door and on my way to make sure I get on the 9.15 bus. Um, when it snows, I may try to end early so everybody can get on their way a little bit early. Before you all leave, though, I'm not done. See, I still have stuff on my slide that I haven't clicked through. Um, a reminder to people that are in the uh, uh, professional learning section of the class, uh, ITS uh, 878, I need to know by next week whether you're going to do the undergraduate or graduate uh, uh, section of the course. Right now, all of everybody in there is in undergraduate curriculum, okay? Uh, if you want to do the graduate curriculum with an idea that later you may convert that course into a course that can apply to a degree, which is possible, 
then you have to let me know that you're going to do the graduate curriculum because I put you in a, an appropriate group. Okay, we have uh, two minutes left. Are there any questions that you feel the entire rest of the class needs to hear? <laughs> okay, if there are no questions that the entire rest of the class needs to hear, I will stick around for at least two more minutes, and uh, you guys can all be on your way. Have a good, uh, have a good weekend. Okay.